All right, so one of the first announcements you really probably need to know, you've been wondering about for a while, when is Art gonna finally get a haircut? And the answer is tomorrow. It's Friday, we're taping, and tomorrow I have an appointment. So I'm figuring I'm gonna lose about 15 pounds. So, you know, you can all set your minds at ease. Next time you see me, I'll be looking sharp. Actually, what we want to talk about is when we gather back together, seriously, that there are a number of things I've alluded to a few different times, but I just want to be, uh, lay out some things. Uh, what we're hoping for is to be able to gather and have both our traditional and our contemporary services. Uh, in that, we will not be offering children's ministry, junior church, Sunday school. We won't be doing uh, any of those things. We're uh, not going to do any food or drink. We're going to encourage folks when they come to wear masks per the Wayne County Health Department recommendation. Uh, equally, we want to encourage those who are sick to stay home and those who are vulnerable to stay home. So if you feel not comfortable coming, um, please don't. We're going to continue to post services online. They'll be a little different, but we're going to continue to put those online. And we will just look forward to and pray uh, for the opportunity for you to rejoin us. But rejoin us when you are ready. And, uh, and we'll be glad to see you. We're going to stagger seating, right? We're going to encourage people to social distance and kind of uh, move around uh, in the sanctuary and the fellowship hall so that there's um, some distance between folks. Uh, one of our members uh, made us offering boxes for our traditional service. We typically have used an offering plate. Uh, we'll have these boxes here in the building and people can just uh, drop their offering in and not have to handle a plate passing by. Um, we'll be sanitizing the rooms that we're using between services um, and we will continue to offer, as I said, the services online. So you won't be missing uh, the services. We won't stop doing that. So those are just some of the things that we're working on. We're also working on the possibility of overflow space so that folks in the sanctuary, if we're kind of full up because we're spread out, that we could be uh, part of the service in the fellowship hall as well with video and audio. Uh, but we're working out the details on that and we've uh, come across some snags but we're going to keep pushing on that so those are just some things i want you to know we're going to gather together as soon as we are uh, comfortable and able and those will be some of the things that we'll be trying all of these will be temporary except i do foresee that we'll continue to post services online moving forward but all these other things will be temporary and eventually things will get back to normal uh, all of this is in the long run only a short-term thing so we're just really looking forward to being together. A Sunday school class met last week in the park in a big circle. It was great to see people face to face and maybe you've had some of those face to face encounters as well. So we'll look forward to being able to regather soon. Please join me as we invite each other to worship. I'll read the light print if you'll join me in the bold. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, the Lord bestows favor and honor, no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Jesus is the solid rock. Let's sing that hymn, The Solid Rock.
Today's scripture reading is 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Father, we thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the sunny days. We thank you for the recent rains. We thank you for the coming summer. We ask, Father, that as farmers plant their crops, that this will be a good year for harvest. We want to pray for our business leaders as they begin to open their businesses back up, that folks will be able to get back to work. And for those that are connected with our church who find themselves without a job, we want to pray, Father, that you will guide them very quickly to jobs that will provide for the needs of their families. We thank you, Father, for those who have graduated from high school, and we celebrate with them this milestone event. We pray for them as they head off to college, that not only will you prepare them for careers, but that you will prepare them for lives of service to you. We lift up the folks that are at home. We want to ask that they would continue to stay healthy. We lift up those who are sick and ask that you would bring healing. We thank you, Father, for all of the blessings that you provide us. And more than any other, we thank you for Jesus Christ who shines within us. Our prayer is that we might take the light of Jesus Christ and shine for him in the community this week. Now speak to us of Jesus Christ through Pastor Art's preaching and then allow us to live obedient lives for him. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
when making a list of items, we often start or could start with the most important as the first item on the list. So you're gonna to go to the grocery store and you desperately need milk, but you might need a few other things. You're probably gonna put milk at the top of the list. You wanna make sure you get it and that you don't get out of your car and realize, oh no, I forgot the milk, even though I got all this other stuff. Uh, you can try that out. In a job description, you might put the most important aspect of the job as the first thing on the list to make sure that whoever's applying will know this is really what we want you to do. And there's a bunch of other things that are gonna follow along or are somewhat less important, but this is the top one. This is the most important thing. When we encounter the passage we refer to as the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five, love leads the list. The characteristic of love leads the list. And as I've said over and over, this is not a list of various fruits of the Spirit, but this is a list of words describing what God wants to grow in each of us. And we might be able to recite the list in our minds. We might be opening our Bibles now and looking at the list, and we can look at each of these words, but Paul puts love at the front end of the list. And it's the one that you could probably argue all the rest spring from. They're all part of, they're all related to loving other people, putting other people first, considering the needs of others in a variety of ways. But Paul leads this list with the word love. In uh, John's Gospel, it says, Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples. Love is a quintessential characteristic of a follower of Jesus. Jesus is saying to his disciples and about his disciples, if you love, people will recognize you are from me. So let's talk about the source of love as we've talked about the source of each of these. And obviously the source of love in the world really is God himself. Uh, 1 John has a lot to say about love. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. It is at the center of who he is. It is one of his characteristics. He is always acting, always working in a loving way. Now, we might contrast that with people. Sometimes people are very loving, and they're very other-focused, and they're interested in the needs of others. And other times, you might say they're in a bad mood, or they're not really all that interested, or they're just interested in themselves. Well, that is never how God is. God always acts out of love, always acts out of concern for others. And this is what we have as an example of love and a description of it. God is love. It's who he is. It is not what he does. It's who he is. It's a characteristic. And it is not, as we might think, in balance with other things. God's love and his justice don't balance each other. They live in perfect harmony with each other. So he is always just and always loving all at the same time. And that might blow our mind a little bit. We might not be able to put all that together, but that's what the scriptures tell us about the God that we serve. Now, later on in that same passage, or in part of that same passage in 1 John, backing up to verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. What is the source of love? The source of love is God. God is the source. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it reads, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. God didn't give us what we deserve. God didn't give us what we earned. He lavished love and grace and mercy on us and gave us what we don't deserve. He gave us exactly the opposite of what we earned. He opened a way for us to have a relationship with him through 
the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. He looked out at our needs from all eternity past, knowing that we'd be separated from him through choosing to walk away from him. And he loved us anyway. And he loved us completely. And he loved us totally. He took us from being enemies to being his family. It's out of love that he created us in the first place. And it's out of love that he pursues us when we run from him because of our own sin. I'm sure you've seen posters around. You might see them on a light post, you might see them on a telephone pole. Posters that are missing pet posters. You might see Facebook posts. This pet or that pet has run off, and the poster would have a picture of the dog or the cat, and it would have a description of the animal, and it might have their name and where they were last seen, and then contact information, so that if you see this animal, you know who to get a hold of. But why do people go through all of that? Why do people bother when their family dog runs off? Why don't they just go get another one? Because they love their pet. And their love for their pet causes them to seek out the pet that is lost. God loves us that much. God loves us that much to come looking for us. Even when we have walked away. Even when we are disinterested in him. Even when we've turned our back on him and his loving commands in our lives. He comes looking for us. Have you ever thought that God's putting up a wanted poster, a lost poster for you? He's come looking for you. And that's how it is. A few years ago, there was a singing group that showed up on a show called Britain's Got Talent, which is much like America's Got Talent, but the people have funny accents. And on Britain Got, Britain's Got Talent, they had a group called the Missing Persons Choir. This was a choir made up of family members of people who have lost, who have people who are missing in their lives. Sons, daughters, parents. They, they went missing at some point. And this collection of people have gotten together to both support one another and to continue the search for these loved ones who are lost. They sang a song on the show called I Miss You. And while the choir was singing, the camera drew back and on the wall behind them were photographs of these people's missing people and the date they went missing. It was a moving experience for the people who were there to see. Here's a group of people who are bound together by this loss that they're experiencing. The choir was made up of the family members and people who had volunteered to be a part of the nonprofit organization they were a part of to help find these people. Why do they keep searching? Why, when a photograph ends up behind the choir as it sings, a photograph from 1975, why are they still looking? Why a, a photograph from 10 years ago? Why do they still keep looking? Because they love these people, and they will pursue them for as long as they can. As a result of the final performance this choir had in the contest, a 13-year-old boy saw his own picture on television and was able then to contact his mother and the family was reunited. Can you imagine the kind of celebration that would happen when your lost son or daughter or your lost parent returned home? Jesus tells a story about a lost son who returns home and the celebration that the father initiates. The fatted calf is killed and the party is thrown and the, the signs of, of love and of honor are given over to the son who had literally walked away, according to Jesus in the story, walked away to live his own way in his own life, and yet the father was waiting and watching and ran out to greet him, to shower him with love. The Bible says that when a sinner turns back, there's rejoicing in heaven. Why? Because God is love, and God acts out of love, and God pursues all of us, even when we've walked away from him. So what are some examples, then, of, of love that we see? Uh, we see uh, a few examples we might think of in the scriptures. Uh, one would be 
the relationship between Ruth and Naomi. If you remember the story, Naomi's two sons have died, uh, her husband has previously died, and she is now deciding to return to her land, and she tells her daughters-in-law, look, you're from this land, and I'm from that land, and I'm gonna head back to, the, to my own home country. You go back and be with your people, and the one daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, no, I'm, I'm going with you. And Naomi sort of tries to push and prod her to not go, to not stay with her, but to head back to her own country and to pursue a, a life that she imagines would be better for her in her own country. But Ruth refuses because she has developed a loving relationship with her mother-in-law. And she returns. And when she returns to the home country of her mother-in-law, she also serves her and cares for her as she is able. Remember, a part of the story is Ruth goes out and gleans from a field, and she's getting the food that she can get, the grain she can get from the perimeter of the field as the harvesters are moving through, not just for herself, but for her mother-in-law. She has grown to love this woman. We can think again about the story Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan who acts so lovingly towards a stranger and does all that the stranger needs to care for him. And of course, the supreme example of love is God and his acts towards us, evidenced in his relentless pursuit of his people. Starting from the Old Testament and moving all the way through the New, it is the story of God pursuing his people and gathering his people and culminating in the New Testament where we find Jesus paying the price for our sins, sacrificing his own son on our behalf that we might know him and love him and be able to serve him. Love involves sacrifice. I read just the other day about a nursing home not far from us here that on March 12th, I believe the day was, they closed their doors. They didn't allow anyone in and anyone out and the people working there volunteered to stay and 65 days later, those people were coming out of the nursing home, all because they wanted to protect the patients, the residents at the nursing home. 225 patients and 44 staff, and they just stayed there for 65 days, separated from their families. None of their family of the residents were able to come in. The staff members didn't leave. They just stayed. Love's about sacrifice. I'm sure it wasn't convenient. I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure it wasn't what those staff members thought when they went to work that one day that they would be doing for the next 65 days, but they did it for the benefit of others. That's love. Paul writes about love in 1 Corinthians. He says that it's patient and kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and it does not fail. Paul gives us a great definition of love to live up to. It's not self-seeking. It looks to the needs of others and tries to meet them. It's not self-focused. It's paying attention. It's not selfish. It's selfless. It's putting others and their needs ahead of ours. So then what is the challenge of love? Well, the challenge of love is to live it out. Here again, the words of John in 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. The challenge is very straightforward. God is love, and we are again to imitate God. We've seen the family resemblance of people. You look at a child and you think, I know who their parent is. I know what family they come from. It may be their physical appearance. It may be their mannerisms, their, their speech. But you can tell where they came from. The Bible tells us people ought to be able to tell that you are followers of Christ because of your love for other people because of your willingness to sacrifice on behalf of others. John went on to write, since God loved us, we ought to love one another. We have received love, therefore we should love one another. What a powerful motivation. We've been loved, and so we're going to love others. And I've heard people say over the years, they were moved in ways, uh, moved by people serving them and loving them and caring for them. And they said in the midst of all that happening, if you ever are going to do something like this for someone else, please let me know. I want to be a part of doing this 
for someone else. I've been served, I've been loved, I've been cared for, I've been attended to, I want to return the favor. But to somebody else, I want to return the gesture of love because I know how powerful it's been in my life. I recently came across a couple of stories that both involve police officers, and I believe these officers have gone way past the motto you see on some cars that says, to protect and serve. In both cases, these officers in different cities were working the streets and they encountered people who had very specific needs. Uh, one officer came across a homeless pregnant woman. And when the woman was encountering the officer at different times through a period of time, the officer was regularly trying to help her. He said in an interview that he would try to do things like find her shelter. And sometimes she would take it and sometimes she wouldn't. But through the experiences they had in interacting with each other over a period of time, they became, began a, a relationship with each other where the officer was trying to serve and care for this woman. On one day, the officer's wife came on a ride along, meaning she rode along in the cruiser with her husband while he was at work. And uh, this is something that some police departments allow. And so she was on this ride along and they came across this homeless woman. And the wife of the officer got out of the car and began to talk with uh, this woman. And she said to uh, the homeless gal, oh, you're pregnant. And the homeless gal took her hand and put it on her stomach. She felt the baby kick. Some time went by when the baby was born and a phone call came to the officer. The woman had decided that she wanted the officer and his wife to adopt this child. Now, this is a police officer helping out a citizen and doing his level best to get them care and comfort and whatever they could give and whatever direction they could give her. And now she wants him, he and his wife, to adopt this child. And that is exactly what this family did. In another case, the officer and his wife, they already had four children. Officer Ryan Hollitz came across a couple preparing to use heroin. He'd been called to another, for another reason to a gas station and happened to look over and see these two who were sitting near the gas station, uh, out kind of out behind the gas station. He recognized what was going on and got out of his car and went over to talk to them. And in the midst of the conversation, he realized the woman was pregnant. He was sort of overwhelmed by the fact that she was pregnant and trying to use these drugs. And so uh, in the conversation, the woman said to this officer that she had been looking for someone to adopt the child that would be born because she knew she couldn't take care of the child. And in short order, the officer said to her, my wife and I will take the child if you want us to, or we'll help you find someone who will. Now, the story goes on that he went and then found his wife to inform her that he had just made this offer to this woman that he met while on patrol. Um, Probably the best part of the story is that this young, this young officer was intending to be a missionary pilot. And so he viewed his work as a police officer as a mission field. And he viewed his work as an extension of loving people. You see the loving servant's heart the two people. His wife, when he was informing her of what he had offered, said immediately, okay, we'll do it. If the story sounds familiar, it's because you probably saw this man and his wife and the young girl as they were honored by President Trump at a State of the Union address some time ago. Folks, loving people is costly. But it was made, it's what we were made to do. We were made to serve people. We were made to sacrifice, sacrifice our time, our talents, our listening ear, whatever it is we have to offer. Christians are called to love and to serve one another. So the challenge is not to define love with words and come up with the best way to describe it, but it is to define love for others by our actions, by our attitudes, by our service. So that when people encounter us, they will say, I have a sense of the family that you are a part of. Well, I was listening to this officer who was interviewed who wanted to be a missionary we hadn't gotten to that part of the story yet and i thought to myself what an example of self-sacrifice what a humble individual what a person both he and his wife who were just willing to go the extra mile and then it comes to be fairly clear that these are followers of jesus and they are living out what it means to love love looks out for the interests of others 
What does it mean to love people currently? What does that look like? Uh, we've been talking a little bit about when we regather and what those kinds of uh, experiences will be like. And I shared with our official board that I thought Christians should be at the forefront of sacrificing, at the forefront of laying aside their rights for the benefit of others. That we should be willing to be inconvenienced and put out, as it were, so that we might serve other people. So when we get back together, we're going to encourage people to socially distant. And I want you to make sure, I'm sure you're all sitting right now, but think about this. If we practice social distancing for a period of time, which I'm sure will be a temporary thing, but if we practice that, you may not be able to sit in your pew in the sanctuary or at your table in the fellowship hall. You may actually have to sit in a different spot during worship. Now, it sounds sort of silly to make a big deal of it, but it will be a little disturbing. We're so used to being here and being in a certain spot and sitting around certain people and all of those kinds of things. But if we're going to spread out to try to follow the six-foot distance rule, we won't be sitting in all the same spaces we've been sitting in. For a time, that will be the case. For a time, when you come, we won't be serving any food, any coffee. I know I probably, before I say no coffee, I should have a helmet on and make sure that nobody can throw anything. But thankfully, this is video, so you can't. But we'll encourage folks to do things like wearing masks. We won't make it mandatory, but we'll encourage it. And when we are encouraged to love others, we will do so because we want to serve those who are around us. Let's think about it this way. Let's say you're going to invite your neighbor over for a meal. And in the process of inviting them, you say, hey, we'd like to have you over for dinner, and how about Saturday at 5, and you kind of make these plans, and then you ask them this question. Do you have any dietary restrictions or any preferences that we should know about in terms of planning the meal? We were thinking about serving, and whatever it was. And let's say you say, we were thinking about serving uh, barbecue chicken. And the person, your neighbor says to you, you know, I, we really don't eat chicken. So what's the loving thing to do? Well, the loving thing to do is to come up with a beef or a pork option that is served, that everybody probably eats the same thing and nobody feels strange or left out or whatever. But let's say somebody says, well, our family doesn't eat meat. Now, is that a bigger problem? And let me suggest to you that if that is the response you get, that is not the, the loving thing to do is not to explain to people the benefits of eating meat. Nor is it the opportunity to explain how detrimental it might be, in your opinion, to just eat vegetables, nor to make a snide remark about it. But it is your opportunity to love and to serve. So to readjust your menu and make it a meatless meal, whether that's your preference or not. When we get back together and we encourage people to wear masks, some people wear them all the time now, some people don't wear them at all. Some people find them to be absolutely essential, others find them to be unnecessary, but I would challenge you to make sure that you are willing to set aside your desires, to be inconvenienced, as it were. To be able to encourage and make others feel comfortable, perhaps, to go beyond what you think you need to do in order to love and to serve, because that's how this church is. I've been so encouraged by the things I've been hearing. I get a hold of people on the phone through the week and just to check in with them. And I find out so many other folks who've been doing the same thing. I hear stories of people who are having a hard time and others from the church knowing about it and reaching out in very special, very particular ways, notes and cards and even a gift of flowers at just the right time. I've heard of people assisting others, jumping in and helping people out when they didn't really even know the people they were helping. Just a, a call came out, hey, let's go do this. And a group got together to do what they were going to do, which was a very powerful thing to do. Loving people may look a little different now, but the principle is the same. How we love people today is how we always have, where we've been thoughtful about what they need. We've been thoughtful about what they desire and what we can do to help them. It means all kinds of things, but the principle stays the same. As I've said already before, the words used to describe the fruit of the Spirit so far, these are not qualities that are praised very often in our society. We're rather told to look out for ourselves, to look out for number one, to make sure we have our own needs met, 
And yet the scriptures tell us over and over, we ought to be looking to the needs of others. In the interview with uh, a sergeant from the police department where the second officer worked, the one that was featured uh, in the State of the Union address, the sergeant actually wrote up uh, an account of what had gone on and gave it to the higher-ups in his own police department. His letter eventually made it to the Oval Office. And when the sergeant was speaking about the officer who adopted the child, he was moved to tears. And he said it was something he had never seen before and something he never thought he would see again in his career and in his lifetime. Folks, the challenge is to love, to sacrifice and to serve the people God puts in front of us, the people who are in our path, applying wisdom and understanding all the while, but loving them and serving them and sacrificing for them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you call us to love and to serve. You call us to be the people who are at the front lines of giving up that we might serve one another. So help us, Father, to see those opportunities, whether they're right in our family, in our neighborhood, in our community, in the church, wherever we are, that we might be great representatives of you, that people would look at us and at least wonder, if not know, these are children of the living God. Amen. Let's sing, The Longer I Serve Him.